The reading of God's Word this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, we'll read from verse 13 through verse 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those that he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges. That is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went into a house. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Within this passage, there is this very intimate reality that Jesus shared between himself and three of the disciples. Three that would be called by later writers his inner circle. Um, The reality of Jesus giving Peter, James, and John nicknames. They were very close to Jesus. They were seen at at the transfiguration of Jesus when Jesus revealed more of himself than anyone had ever seen. Like walking into a dark room, you can make out only so much. I've walked into dark rooms before with my with my kids asleep in the crib, but I needed to grab something so I'd I'd turn on the light for just a second so I could see if it was there. It was like at the transfiguration, a flash of Jesus, just a glimpse, was given. And it was to those three. When Jesus prayed privately at times with only a few of them, say in Gethsemane, it would be those three, his inner circle. Something about his relationship with those particular three was a bit more intimate. Later, they would be the ones that would contribute in writing to the New Testament. Peter, James, and John all have writings within the canon of the New Testament, and it was to them that he gave these names. To Peter, he gave the name Peter. That wasn't his name. It was Simon. Uh, Peter being a basic word for rock in Greek, um, or Cephas, some texts say, which is the same meaning, rock, but only in another language, uh, Aramaic. But to James and John, he gave this strange nickname. Um, first, in the original language, it was Bonerges. Now, I don't, I don't know why that nickname hasn't stuck around. Um, you may think of that if you're having a child. But the meaning of it was sons of thunder. What exactly does that mean? I want to reflect on that. Over the next few weeks, we're going to reflect on these three who are in the inner circle. James and John, and then three weeks from now, Peter. Three weeks from now, there is a, there is a pastor who is planting a United Methodist Church, that is, a church that did not exist, and the conference has appointed this pastor to plant a brand new church in D'Iberville called The Bridge. Um, this reverend and I will swap. I will go talk about Peter in their pulpit, and that pastor will come here and reflect on Peter here. But over the next two weeks, we're going to reflect on James and John. Today, specifically, on what is this nickname? What does this mean? What does it mean to them? 
What did Jesus mean by it? Why did he give him that nickname? And then, and then what does that mean for us in our relationship with Jesus? Now, the idea of, of God giving names to people other than their birth name is not an anomaly. It's something actually you can see throughout Scripture. The world may give someone a name. God sees something else going on in that person's life and gives them another name to live into. Abram, which means something like high father, very good father, good name. It's good to be a good father. God had a call on his life and gave him the name Abraham, which means father of many nations. A name given for Abram to live into, something other than the name that the world gave him. Abram's wife, Sarai, which means princess or my princess, was given the name Sarah, which means mother of nations. Jacob, which means basically swindler or trickster or heel grabber, you may know a Jacob, be careful, was given the name Israel. God had something more in plan for Jacob than just a swindler, a trickster, heel grabber. Israel means one who wrestles with God and overcomes. Saul in the New Testament was given the name Paul. Saul was a, uh, a Hebrew name, a fine name, but Paul was more Latin-based, which I think because God had planned for Saul a ministry to the rest of the world, not just the Hebrews, and so gave him a name that would be palatable to the rest of the world. But what of this nickname? Names mean a lot. Names mean a lot. When people get married, names change. That is a very significant thing. I, I read an article recently. This guy fell in love with a woman, and her last name was Packer. And this is a true story. He was a huge Green Bay Packers fan from birth, and so he took her name. He wanted to be the Packers, and so they are. Names mean a lot. Maybe you were given a nickname at some time in your life, and it may have affected you, good or bad. When I was a young boy, uh, we would spend summers with our dad, me and my older brother, and my older brother had a nickname, and his nickname was Wits. Wits. And dad used to call him that a lot. And then finally, dad gave me a nickname. And, and his nickname for me was Motormouth. <laughs> now, I've only been negatively affected by that later on in years because when I heard him say it as a kid, I promise you this is true, <laughs> I thought he said Motormouse. And so I pictured a little mouse with a black leather jacket riding a Harley with a little helmet. I loved it. Only later did I have to go to therapy because my dad <laughs> called me motor mouth rather than wits. But what does this mean? What does it mean for them to be given this name Sons of Thunder? We know from the past week that thunder has some obvious ideas connected to it. A lot of noise, sound, breaking out. You can hear it for miles around. You can even hear thunder in other times. Because when the lightning strikes, for some of us, it's not till moments later that we hear it. So quite literally, it penetrates time. I don't know if this is what Jesus meant by sons of thunder for James and John, but there's no doubt if you look at their lives in Scripture, their lives made noise. And the noise that their lives made penetrated time. John would end up writing five letters that ended up in the New Testament. The only one who was more prolific than John in the New Testament would be Paul. 
known probably perhaps more, John is, for the book of Revelation. Talk about a book that has penetrated throughout time. Painted a picture in almost everyone's eye who has been to church of heaven descending and marrying with earth. The two becoming one. Heaven and earth kissing, if you will. Finally harmonizing. Every tear wiped away. Never a night, it'll always be day. He made noise with his life. James, the same thing. James would be, if you don't know, in the book of Acts, James would be the first disciple to be so convinced of the realities of the resurrection, to be so moved by Jesus' command to bear witness to his resurrection, that he would stare face, stare face down the threat of death, and would not recant. He would become the first martyr of the disciples. Read it in the book of Acts, chapter 5. Their lives made noise. But, but hear me, their lives made noise not just on this superhuman level, but also on the, on the immature level. Interestingly enough, James and John... Uh, in terms of their faith life, were, were infants when they met Jesus. Um, the two stories that stand out the most to me of James and John are one, now you probably know this story if you've been in church, they sent their mom to get something from Jesus that they wanted. You ever done that? Hey mom, can you talk to Jesus for us? sent mom to Jesus to see if Jesus would let them be first and second in the kingdom, to sit at his right and his left. How selfish is that? And the other disciples heard about it. So they made noise, not just in good ways, but at the start of their relationship with Jesus, made all kind of noise in in infant ways. Um, There was also a time when they were walking through Samaria. Now, Jews had a lot of tension between the Samaritans, and as, as Jesus and his disciples were walking, the Samari- Samaritans didn't want him to walk through the town and made them go around, which likely meant they would have to cross the Jordan one time and then cross it again another. It was very inconvenient. And so James and John were like, Jesus, you want us to call hellfire out from the sky and just burn them up? What I think perhaps was the most noise being made by James and John, perhaps, uh, was their growth. The growth from who they were when Jesus met them, the growth that he saw that they lived into based on this name that he gave them. It was their growth that I think really made noise. If you think about thunder, it's not just a sound. Thunder is the sound of an actual event, which is lightning. And interestingly enough, lightning happens when there is a huge, uh, I believe it's a negative charge that is at the base of a cloud system. And when that negative charge gets heavy enough, the cloud sends out what's called, and fishermen, you will know this term, a leader. And as that leader gets strong enough, from the ground there is, a, there is a positive charge and it sends up what is called a streaker. And if the leader gets low enough and the streaker gets high enough, they will connect and make a circuit, a literal circuit. And that is when you have the loud flash and immediate crash. I think what happened with James and John was that their growth, was such an arc that it connected heaven and earth and literally a sound would be heard that would echo throughout the ages, quite literally. They would live into their names because of their spiritual growth in Jesus. And so they would know what it would feel like to not just be a say, a Clark Kent, 
they would live into being a superman through their relationship with Jesus. They would not just be a Peter Parker. They would live into their relationship with Jesus and become in him a Spider-Man. Or they wouldn't just be a Diana Prince. They would become a... Come on. Thank you. And I would suggest to all of us that this potential for growth is available to all who call the name of Jesus. The faith that Jesus taught about was something like a mustard seed. Now, when you hear that lesson of Jesus, if you'd have faith like a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. You may think that, that what he's, all he's saying is if you would just have a little faith. But that, I don't think that is the complete picture of what Jesus is saying. There is another place where Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a mustard seed. And he doesn't say, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is really small. That's not his point. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed because it starts out really small. But then it grows into something so large that the birds of the air find shelter in. When Jesus is telling his disciples, if you would just have faith like a mustard seed, you, even you, could move mountains. It's not just if you would just have small faith. He's saying, the faith that you have in me, you may not know it yet because you haven't lived into it, but the faith that you have in me is something that is going to grow into something fantastic. Something life-changing. So you may not know this about yourself. I don't know where you stand in your relationship with Jesus. But the faith that is dwelling in your heart, the faith that is wrecking your mind about what you think of the man Jesus is something with, with some ridiculous potential. Surprising potential. Let me show you this. This is, a, this is a, an image that you're going to see a lot of this summer. Can you see this? You know what that is? I wish I had a mustard seed. It's not a mustard seed. That would be a really good sermon if it was a mustard seed. I'm going to throw this seed at you. It's a watermelon seed. It's a watermelon seed. I know you can't see it from back there. That's part of the point. This thing has a lot of potential. You know from this that this isn't all there is to the story of this little guy. No. The reality is that <laughs> one day... Can you hear me now? Can you see it now? Yeah. One day when it grows, you will be able to see the impact of this little thing for distances that you could not see the impact of this little thing. Because the, the potential of this guy is remarkable. You can fit about six watermelon seeds into a gram. That's how much it weighs, about 28 grams about in an ounce, 16 ounces in a pound, I believe. And this guy is probably 15 to 20 pounds. If you do the math, that means this little guy right here is going to multiply 40,000 times. Before it gets to here. That's the potential. That your faith has in your life. It may be somewhere. That might seem in, insignificant. And maybe it seems so in, insignificant. Because of names. People have put on you. In your life. But there's another name. That God has covered you with. And if you, will, 
if you will just receive that name he has given you and live into that, you will see the potential of this faith just explode in your life. In Christ, there is no Greek or Jew. Don't let that be your limiter. There is no male or female. Don't let that be your limitation. There is no black or white. There are followers of Jesus. And if they'll just have faith, like a mustard seed, they're going to be shocked. James and John didn't have a clue when Jesus gave them this nickname, what that meant. They had no clue that the lightning from their life was going to resound throughout the ages, that it was going to transform this world. They had no idea. And you may not either. You may think, okay, the label on you is teenager. Lord, what did that, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Maybe all you can think of is annoying. Because when people say teenager, they don't just say teenager with a neutral face. They say teenager. Teenager. Don't let that be a, a label that limits you in your life. Jeremiah, a major prophet, perhaps arguably the greatest prophet in Scripture, was a teenager, a teenager, and became the most preeminent prophet of the Messiah, Jesus. Timothy, Paul's greatest encourager, was a teenager. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was just a teenager. And the faith from her life transformed the world. And don't go to the other spectrum. Don't just let some label like senior limit what you think is possible in your faith. There is more to you. You are a follower or you are a disciple. Someone who is being intentional about learning. You, you stepped away from follower years ago. You're being intentional about growing in Jesus. You are a learner. Or maybe you've even stepped away from disciple. You are an apostle. You are ready to be sent on behalf of Jesus. You are not just a senior. Moses, in his greatest day, was a senior. Yeah, when he was 40, which is where you think you had all the vim and vigor, he was just leaving Egypt. In between 40 and 80, he was a shepherd in Midian. That's probably why he started stuttering so much, hanging around, hang, hang, hanging around with the sheep. It was when he was 80, 80, 80, like Rogaine 80, that he was sent to be another name. He was given the name Deliverer, Liberator. This was Moses. The lawgiver, healer of a nation. Don't just let sin, senior be a limiter to you. Rahab is one of the biggest superheroes in Scripture, and she was a harlot, a prostitute. She delivered in the book of Joshua the whole town of Jericho to the Israelites. Matthew was a tax collector. Maybe you have a vocation that is just looked upon as a label. And it is hard for you to imagine faith exploding in your life. Matthew did not let the label of tax collector limit him. In his faith, he became the great commissioner. He had another label. And James and John were not just fishermen. They may have been just fishermen when they met Jesus. But there, there was more in store for them. He saw the arc of their spiritual growth and the electric explosiveness it had in its potential. And they would become sons of thunder. So three questions for you as you chew on this lesson today. Very simple. 
What label have you allowed the world to place on you that is limiting your impact? That's not who you are. You are so much more. Or, what label do you receive from Jesus today? Why wait? Follower? Break through all those other labels. That's not you. Disciple? You're tired of being a follower? You've sat there too long? It's time to get intentional about your learning with Jesus? Become a disciple. You've been sitting in the pew for years and years and years. You're ready to break through that and become an apostle? Receive that name. Or maybe you're a son of thunder. Or maybe you're a motor mouse. Or maybe you're a mountain mover. Maybe you're a game changer. Maybe you're an evil eater. Maybe you're a flashlight mouth. I'll tell you one thing that keeps people from growing spiritually is butts. Yeah, I would, but. Maybe your name is no more butts. And just but for short. Or three, what measure of faith, what measure of faith in between this little guy and this do you have? Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the very real picture that you gave us of the folks whom you called to yourself. We thank you that you didn't just leave us with the outcome of their ministry. There is just no answering of the question, how did the lives of these 12 so radically change the world? Especially when we look at who they were before they met you. They're not very impressive. It was their relationship with you, God. And so we pray this day that you would open up the, the relational channels between us and you. We want nothing more but to be known by whatever identifier you want to place upon our lives, God. So many names have been given to us throughout the years. And we hear the negative stuff. That's what sticks. It's not our predisposition to let the positive, the beautiful, the life-giving name stick to us. We hear the bad stuff. Lord, may we not be limited by that. May we hear your voice speaking over us today that we are a child of God, that we are a follower of Jesus, and our faith in you can and will move mountains. In Jesus' name, amen.